Welcome everybody to Real Estate Investing for Medical Professionals. Today, we are joined by Roger Curry. Roger is a market forecasting expert with over 20 years of experience. Early on in his career, he discovered an inherent flaw in all market investment strategies. And he overcame that flaw in 2010 with an innovative price forecasting method called market vulnerability analysis, which incorporates all of the major supply and demand factors that move the market. Building on the foundation of the system's exceptional accuracy, Roger developed a strategy called demand imbalance arbitrage. And in 2019, Roger launched the Market Forecasting Academy, where he teaches financial market forecasting, which is the engine that drives the success of demand imbalance arbitrage. So welcome, Roger. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's a great discussion to have talking about the stock market, because oftentimes in investments, a lot of these different asset classes are pitted against each other, right? It's multifamily versus the stock markets, or it's multifamily versus industrial. So if our investors can find a way to be successful, both in the stock market and in real estate, it's a win-win for everybody. So before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about you know your story and how you became the expert that you are today? Yeah, actually, I started to uh, cut the bug of uh, trade for a living, trade from home back in 1996. That was when the whole trading revolution kind of really took off for people. And so back then, as we started, there was a lot of just new industries that were, that were sprouting up to support the individual retail trader. Well, it took me about 14 years. And over that time, I'd spent over $300,000 on just training and education costs alone, just continually looking for the next new thing, what's working now, version 2.0 of something. Always, you know, I, I was never cheap about my education or, or any of the help that I wanted to get. So I was always looking to get the best that I could get my hands on, but nothing ever seemed to give me a long-term sustainable level of performance consistency. And, and when I did have performance, it was not without stress. So having had that roller coaster of emotions and not being able to have something that's really consistent was driving me crazy. But I had a, a series of just unfortunate circumstances, one right after the other. Felt like I had um, a dark cloud over my head. I felt like I was, you know, just, just like, what well, am I cursed in life? What's wrong? Well, that was a blessing in disguise because that drove me into a situation where, where one day I decided to throw literally everything out. And I was looking at my, just my business development consulting practice, which kind of really paid for all, all those expensive lessons, <laughs> 14 years. And so what happened was I realized, well, nowhere else in business or any industry does someone keep going back to school to relearn something, you know, it was just like, there's something, it sounds like there's something inherently wrong with this industry. And I, it was driving me nuts because, you know, you go to pilot school, you do that one time, you get certified and you can build a very stable, very consistent, very successful career flying aircraft, right? You know, you go to medical school, you go to the medical school once, right? And, and so that you become a doctor and then you just, you're able to practice. And, and both of those require, guess what? training with another person. The doctor goes to residency, they have someone overlooking their shoulder. There's a wisdom to skill sets like that. And I realized something is just kind of off. And so I, I don't know, I really, I think it's per, just prop, not, I think I'm convinced it was providential because what happened to me was not logical. I began to see things that were not related or connected to the, to the markets, but, the, but they were principles in life that I started putting into place one route to the other. One thing led to another. And all of a sudden I, I realized, oh my God, this whole industry, professionals included, are distracted by the price of things, right? And so they look at fundamentals, they look at technical analysis and, you know, maybe news or geopolitical. Basically they're, they're fundamentally looking at one or two things that, that help them assess whether a stock or or any symbol, whether it's commodities, Forex, crypto, it doesn't matter. They're looking at those things to help them understand whether this is a undervalued, right? Where it's mm -hmm. going to have the potential to grow and increase. Well, the problem is price itself is a lagging indicator. But people think, well, wait a second, 
price and stops the lagging unit to what? Well, what causes all prices to move up or down, whether it's the real estate market or the stock market, right? It's demand. As demand grows or increases, right? Prices begin to follow. If, if demand uh, decreases, prices fall. So if you want to sell your house, let's say you put it up on the market and no one's buying at that price, guess what? You're going to have to drop your price to sell it, right? But if you have 20 buyers who want your house, now there's a bid more. They're, they're going to actually bid up what you were originally asking for. So demand is the most objective and reliable indicator of what price is likely to do next because demand moves first, price follows after. Okay. So, I mean, I like to use this rubber band analogy. I love this because you can see, like, as demand, if you think about this, you know, maybe demand's right here, price is right here. Okay. So, as demand goes, price has to follow, right? So, as this thing kind of expands, you have a natural tendency for it to want to snap back, right? It's following demand. Most people are looking for these, these areas where they think price is going to move from one area to the next because they, they've assessed that, well, it's undervalued or what, however they come to that. Okay. What's interesting is where most people are running into the experience of inconsistency, the experience of uncertainty, which drives fear, right? Second guessing yourself, doubting. This roller coaster of emotion where you need trade psychology to stick to the rules. Well, all that's based on because I, I don't know what to expect next, right? Why? Because I'm so focused on price and the price of things. Well, there's eight major factors of demand. We call them demand factors. And there's, and each of them have subsets. If you're primarily looking at fundamentals and technical analysis, that's just two out of eight. So you've got six other things that can blindside you when you're in the middle of actually investing in whatever position you have, right? So what happens is when people look at those two factors, that's like looking at a, at the, at a rubber band like this that's just stretched out just so much, right? And you're hoping it's going to snap to where you want it to go. However, what they don't see because they're not looking at the demand is that maybe demand in that case has the ability to continue to cause price to stretch even further out, right? And what we want are only the opportunities where the demand is significantly out of balance with price. That's demand imbalance, right? Arbitrage. We're taking advantage of the difference. We're profiting from a very significant imbalance between where price is and where the actual demand is because that creates, when it's really stretched out like that, it creates an extremely low probability, right? Low risk for the market to continue to go away from you, which is what causes people to hold on to large downturns. We call that direct drawdowns in the market, right? And now they're sitting waiting and hoping for the market to recover. And then now 10, 15, 20%, 30% or more, you know, waiting for the market to recover. And we've been spoiled in the, in the US because the market continually retests the highs and goes higher. But in Japan, the Nikkei index, when it had hit a high more than 30 years ago, I think now, it corrected and it never retested those highs you know, over 30 years, right? So the market doesn't have to come back and retest those highs. You might not have time to make up years of financial growth all of a sudden are looking at retiring or wanting to pull any, any capital out and all of a sudden you're down 30, 50% on your portfolio. And remember, if the market goes down, if, you're, if your portfolio loses 50% of its value, the market itself would have to double, right? It doesn't have to. So if you lose 50%, get to make up your money by having a 50% increase. You have to have a 100% increase in the market for you to just get back to break even. And so now add into that the cost of inflation, rising inflation, and you've really lost. And if you just get back your money that you started with, you're still behind because inflation has eaten up the value of your dollar, right? Do we really want to continue playing Russian roulette with that sort of a, a situation? So demand and balance arbitrage is basically taking a very low risk with a high probability for an opportunity to profit that gives you no less than an 80 to 90% analysis accuracy. In other words, you can be confident that you're going to be right about your analysis and your decision 80 to 90% of the time. And that dramatically changes everything. That's what I call making peaceful profits. I love that. I love that. And we're starting to see the same thing in the multifamily space too, where there's a real sort of mismatch between sellers expectations and pricing and what buyers can afford to pay with the rising debt, the leverage that we're getting. So I think it's a really timely discussion to talk about demand imbalance arbitrage. And you know, I also love your, your origin story because it sounds like you're doing something very similar to Vic and Ravi where you were scratching your own itch. You weren't out there to 
make a profit. You weren't out there to eventually you're going to teach others, but that wasn't the origin story, right? The origin was, hey, I have this issue. Doesn't seem to be really prevalent in the market. Let me create something that that provides that value. And Vic and Robbie did the same thing when they transitioned from physicians into real estate. They you know noticed all of their friends saying, hey, how are you guys being so successful? How are you getting out of working 80 hour weeks? You know, how are you finding so much free time and it's by scratching your own itch, which is which is awesome. Right. And people, when they think about stocks or trading, they often think about day trading. Can you explain the difference between day trading and what you're doing? Absolutely. That's a great question, actually. Day trading is often associated with someone who's kind of speculating on what they think the market's going to do within a few minutes or an hour or so. And so demand and balance arbitrage, strangely, looks like you're day trading on the surface. You know, if you're looking over someone's shoulder, you go, wow, you're day trading. Uh, actually, we're investing in very objective, very clear micro cycles within the day. Why? So when you have the ability to analyze the demand in real time, look what happens. When you have a grasp of what the demand factors are doing moment by moment, minute by minute, cycle by cycle, you're literally seeing the, the impact of hundreds of thousands of orders that are coming into the market throughout the day, right? And that's causing prices to cycle up and down throughout the day, right? So what's happening is you can look and see, wow, the demand factors in the moment. Okay, I could see, for instance, demand is up here and price is down here. I know automatically that price has to move up to catch up to demand. And what's interesting is demand is always this ever-expanding contract factor, right? And then so price is always kind of swinging like a pendulum trying to catch up to where demand is. So it's always coming in and out of balance with demand. And we can see that, right? So as an example, last year, I had someone ask me about Tesla. And Tesla back then, it was I think it was before the split, if I'm not mistaken, and it was back up to $1,000. And they're thinking, wow, this it's right back up to a thousand. It was up there before. It keeps going higher. Maybe it's time to buy. I said, hold on a second. We did the demand analysis and we could visually see a lot of how I developed my process. It's very, it's called visual behavioral analysis. So the way I developed it, it makes it very simple and easy to quickly, like within a couple of minutes, right? And sometimes seconds, you can look at it and instantly realize here's what's going on. Just like you would when you sit in a car and you know you have a, a 250 mile road trip ahead of you, you look and you realize you've got a quarter of a tank of gas. Well, instantly, right? Without looking under the hood, without reading the, the, the manual, without any complex calculations, 250 miles are not going to, uh, a quarter tank of gas is not going to give you that, right? You're going to have to refuel, right? So you don't have to be nervously hoping you'll make it, right? You know that you got to stop and refuel. So those kinds of clear objective data points are really critical. So with demand and balance arbitrage and with market vulnerability analysis, you're seeing where the market is vulnerable. And with that, you'll be able to see where demand is. And so what we saw was, well, visually, we could see prices at a thousand, but demand, we could see visually demand was basically on the same level it was the last time price was at 700. In other words, price went up to a thousand, Demand had fell, so the, all the demand factors were interested when Tesla was at 700. You instantly knew that within a, a day or two or three, very timely, not six months, nine months, a year later, no, within a day or two or three, or maybe a week at the most, you're going to see Tesla correcting by 30%. How valuable is that information to your portfolio? I mean, think about that. So demand and balance arbitrage is basically looking at the cycles based on your interest, whether your interest is intraday in the day, whether it's just an hour and a half, two hours a day, early in the morning, late at night, middle of the day, doesn't matter, right? Because the market's pretty much open 24 or five, essentially, right? You've got some blocks in there where you have to, where it's just where you can't trade. But outside of that really fits your lifestyle and in your time, right? Or maybe your time objective is, is uh, daily or weekly or multi-week or multi-month, right? Maybe it's long-term. Maybe you want to protect your long-term asset, your portfolio from these double-digit corrections or crashes, right? So because there is no market that can correct or crash 
without having an environment that's conducive for that to occur. In other words, you and I can't walk out under a clear blue sky and it's suddenly raining and thunder and lightning. We're going to see clouds rolling in. We're going to see the temperature change. We're going to see the wind kick up, the barometric pressure ch- shift. All those things are identifiable factors. And the most important aspect to this is that they take time to build. And that's what makes them forecastable. And so we can very accurately forecast storms. And the market is no different. We can accurately forecast when there's a storm in the market that's that's brewing, when there's room and reason for the market to correct by double digits, right? And so that's how we're able to see because of demand, the market's going to either move significantly up or down, or we can actually see neutrality between price and demand, where guess what? There's not a whole lot of opportunistic uh, things to take advantage of. And so you see the market going sideways, right? Isn't that interesting? So you can actually forecast where the market's going sideways, up or down, or you can make money either way or just be, take a defensive action. So if you're focused on being very efficient, let's say, and so you're, you're working 70 hours a week and you don't really have more than an hour and a half or two hours a day as a doctor. Well, you want to ex- ha- have a, the control over your performance outcomes, but also control over your experience so you're not stressed and battling and playing this like a war emotionally with the market. You want to have open to no stress experience. So what do you do? You look at the vulnerabilities, look at where demand is. And what you can do is you say, oh, I can see prices here. I can see demand is over here. And I can also see there's some vulnerability just beneath that area where price is at. Well, that tells me now where the market's minimally going to go, minimally, and where the market's unlikely to go from a statistical perspective, where the odds are 80, 90% in favor of not going further before first hitting that target, you just set up a parameter. Now you know legitimately where the market can't go before hitting that target. And then you see based on where prices, do I have at least $1 return for every dollar of risk I'm taking or better? I don't want to risk more than what I can make when I initialize the position. I want to be able to make at least a dollar for every dollar I'm risking or more. If I can make $2 for every dollar I'm risking, great. $3 for every dollar I'm risking, even better. But I don't want to risk more than what I'm willing to, uh, able to make. And so now those parameters give me a very clear, very objective, very confident, and a consistent ability to reliably repeat a process that produces performance that easily enables me to outperform the market, stay well ahead of inflation, experience an accelerated compounding effect that grows my account in a meaningful and impactful way that can actually slowly move me towards replicating my primary gains of dirt or whatever industry I'm in. And that can allow me to start to gain what? Time freedom. Because if I can replicate my primary income with a part-time effort because of the accelerated ability to be consistent at a high rate and compound that account in a meaningful way, it's not uncommon for someone to spend two hours a day, let's say in the morning, Okay, before we start the, the, the day at the, at the office or at the hospital. And you might have one half hour session in which you're able to see that now you'll see a lot of opportunities along the way, but we'll see very stormy scenarios that would stress me out. So like if I can forecast a storm, would it be wise for me to go run my errands in the middle of a storm? No, I can hydroplane. The chances of me getting an accident increase dramatically. No, I'd rather wait for the storm to pass and then I go out and run my errands. Well, the market's so different. And market vulnerability analysis gives you that ability so that you can see the conditions of the market. And environmentally, I can say, you know what? I know the market's going to, I can see where the market's going to go. It's I can forecast that, but boy, what I might have to sit through is going to jolt my nerves. I'd rather stay away and wait for something more peaceful. And so you, you just say no, right? Objectively. And then you go, oh, look, clear blue skies in the market. And there's an opportunity to profit because I see demand is significantly out of balance with where price is. And now that is an area in which in 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, I can literally risk a maximum of 2% of my account capital or less. Okay. And since we don't set up a position unless we can know we can at least make that or more in profit, that means if I'm going to risk 2%, then I know I should be able to make at least 2% or more on that position, right? On that cycle. Because where your focus is, if your focus is on minute charts, then it'll take minutes to evolve, to complete the cycle for price to go from where it's at to meet where demand is. If you're on an, on an hourly chart, 
then it's going to take hours. If you're on a daily chart, it'll take days. If you're on a weekly chart, it's going to take weeks and so on and so forth. So where your focus is, that's where you can apply the analysis. It doesn't care. The analysis works on any time frame, any market uh, condition, any asset class, any symbol, it doesn't matter. But that way you have a level of control over your outcomes, which is priceless because now you're not stressed. So if you just made percent during that 10 hour commitment over the week, right? Two hours a day, five days a week. And it took you half hour, 45 minutes to make that 2%. I mean, that's just, that's a very modest, very conservative, very realistic ability with demand imbalance arbitrage. So it may look like day trading, but day trading is speculative. We're demand imbalance arbitrage. We're literally investing very efficiently, very effectively in these small micro cycles in the movements of the day or the week or the hour, again, whatever the person's time frame is, but they're able to be very efficient and have a tremendous level of control and know that they're going to be right no less than 80 to 90% of the time. And that's right. what demand and balance arbitrage, it's a different kind of opportunity. It's not like normal trading. Yes, you're trading your money for the opportunity to make more. So with Warren Buffett though, right? But he's just, his, his horizon is a long time frame, but he is trading his capital for the opportunity to make more. We're just doing it in, in smaller efficient cycles because of the ability to see where demand is in real time and where the vulnerabilities are. And that gives us a very controlled outcome. Does that make sense? 100%. 100%. And there's two points there that I really want to touch on that I think bring the most power to that system. One of it is it's in real time. We're, yeah. we're experiencing the same thing on the real estate side where we're, we're looking at reports that may be of last quarter or last year. And even when they're saying, for example, we just had this happen where we didn't really see cap rate compression happen in terms of pricing starting to increase or decrease. And if it's in real time, that gives you an advantage over those who are looking at those lagging indicators. Correct. The second point is the objective part of it, where you don't have to rely on speculation or, or how you're feeling. It's really an objective measure that eliminates all that stress, which can kind of change the way that you act, the way you perform, the way you trade, the way you invest. So to have it in real time and to have it be objective, I think are the, the key points, especially now with you know how the market's performed, at least for you know most people in the last year, year and a half, most people didn't want to look at their four hundred one ks or you know their IRAs because of how the market return the market returns were, and that created some investor hesitancy. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think is the main obstruction to investors really being successful in today's market? There's a couple of things. I find a lot of people feel like they are smart enough or equipped or don't think they, ha they have enough time or they're just uh, afraid to fail. But when there's a, a time-tested proven process, kind of like a franchise, why do, people, why, why do people look at franchises? Because it's a tested, proven system, a process that basically when you apply the process, right, it produces the outcomes, right? It, so process always is the, the key factor that produces predictable outcomes. And so that's why people invest in franchises. So when we have a process like market vulnerability analysis that drives the success of demand and balance arbitrage, what happens is we've got 12 plus years now of track record that where people are replicating what I did for myself initially. And, and like you said, by the way, I, I have to just let people know, I never intended on teaching this, like, like you said. Uh, it was when, you know, one time a lady at church, she knew that I'd taught Sunday school and, and, and uh, she, she just, she just saw that I had all this time on my hands. I was spending a bunch of time during the week with them for several weeks, you know, hanging out. She's like, can I just ask you a question? How is it that you're out here hanging out with us and helping? Cause I really love that you're here helping us during the week, but you know, us old ladies here, we're, we're we know why we're here. We're tired. You were tired or whatever, but, but what about you? You're young. You look like you live well, What do you trust one baby or <laughs> you won the lottery or something. I said, no, no, I, you know, talking about it. It's like, oh, wow. She's like, but isn't that like gambling and very risky? I said, not the way that I've developed it. And so it's actually more conservative and more, way more controlled than any other people that I can imagine. She's like, wow. And then a few months later, her, she came up to me. She said, you know, my son just graduated high school and I know you love to help and, you know, you enjoy teaching. Would you be willing to teach my son what you do? And I said, I'd love to. Do. And that's, that's what kind of spurred on. And, and then it just, and then, other people started saying, hey, would you go on and teach me? And then one summer, it was, I had like 12 to say, like, would you go on and teach us? You know, they were all like, just kind of, they told each other. To this day, actually 90% of my clients 
come from word of mouth referrals from existing clients and only 10% is kind of when, and now that people have found out about me, like, like yourselves, you yeah, know, exactly. will ask me to be on a podcast or something, you know, but it's really amazing. That, that says a lot that 90% are word of mouth referrals from existing clients. But that was when I realized, wow, I got to do something serious here. And I, mean, and I created a curriculum and I did it really serious. And it was very, probably one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life. But the point is people who feel like they're not smart enough or don't have enough time, this only takes 10 to 15 hours a week as a sweet spot. That's even full time. You don't even have to go beyond that once you go, you know, if you replace your income over a few years because you let it compound, you never have a need to go beyond that, right? So number one, it doesn't take a lot of time. Number two, it's visually oriented. Like I said, if you can sit down in your car, see that you have a quarter tank of gas, you know your target is a 250 mile road trip. Well, right there, you know, it's an instant visual calculation. I, I need refuel, right? So it's not that much more, more complicated. If someone's learned how to use a smartphone for the first time or when they first sat down in front of a Windows computer, that felt intimidating and, and kind of scary, right? But when you realized, you know, you got familiar with it, it became like as simple as stealing candy from a baby, right? It's, a, it's the minus button, minimizes, the square restores, X closes. It's just getting familiar because it's very visual, right? So it's very visually oriented. But it's not, it's not any more complex than, than something like that. And so when you have a process that, that produces those kinds of outcomes, I think investors are going to struggle if they're going to rely on someone who doesn't know this and doesn't have this in their real house. So, you know, I would say if they have a money manager, is their money manager using market vulnerability analysis on their portfolio to enable them to avoid causing them to sit through a double digit drawdown, right? A downturn. What, what? So they want to ask that question. What about them taking that into, a, into their own you know, wheelhouse so that they understand it's a skill set they can use for the rest of their lives. There's no version 2.0. This is something I developed in 2010, and I've never had to fix it, modify it, tweak it, or update it since I developed it, which is saying a lot, right? Because it's right. A, it works like a barometer. It doesn't matter whether you use it on top of a mountain, the bottom of a valley, in the North Pole, in a desert. The barometer is going to work the same exact way and produce the same reliable outcome, right? So this is no difference. A process like Flying an aircraft. You follow the process, you're going to take off and land successfully, make a very stable, successful career out of it. So that's what this is. It's not this thing where you try and hope. So I'd say, I would say you have to take things into your own hands. You have to be willing to invest a little bit of time in yourself to be able to learn a skill like this that puts control in your hands. And at least at minimum, if your financial advisor, your money manager isn't aware and isn't uh, using this, I've got some professional clients, but if they're not using this for their clients, well, that individual can use it to then help direct their money manager. Say, hey, listen, call up Mr. 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 Uh, uh, money manager, please take me in all cash. Why? That's a, please just take me in all cash. And all of a sudden the market a week later dumped 20%. Like, how'd you know that Mr. You know, client? So you, you understand? And it's like, you know, at least do that for yourself. But if you also want to look at replacing or replicating at least your income uh, to work towards more time freedom. This is one of the best vehicles on the planet because it takes a laptop or reliable internet connection and a very part-time effort. Like I said, a couple hours a day, it doesn't matter when, but you can actually reliably work and very consistently with great confidence, work towards that and know that you're going to actually come out on the other end better and with more control and more secure, by the way, right? So I think that is one major factor that people really need to consider is willing to do it for themselves. The other factor is there's a lot of uncertainty post COVID. And so with labor shortages, with the great reset, you know, you're, if you read the book, uh, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum, there's a lot of things that are, there are people up there that are looking at refashioning the world and their image, how they see it. And that's not necessarily how you and I might want to abide by it. So we need to be able to have a skill that, that isn't necessarily attached or reliant or dependent on the things that they're, they're going to want to change. And so there's nothing more powerful than to know how to make your money work for you, right? right? How, to make, how to go to the capital markets, because that's really the lifeblood and the heartbeat of the entire world's economy, right? And so I think it's really important to realize that that increased volatility from the uncertainty is something you don't have to be a victim of or, or be manipulated by, which by the way, that brings me to one more point. A lot of people are scared of the markets because they, they think, well, it's rigged, it's manipulated. Well, sure it is. Mm -hmm. So, but shouldn't you be able to take that into account? So market vulnerability analysis actually takes that into account. So people who have experience come to me 
all the time and tell me after they learn my method, they realize I used to like think I had a, a good position that was solid and, and then the market would just dip and pull and, and stop me, give me a loss and then it would end up going without me. And it would be such an aggravating thing. I felt it was like personally being uh, attacked by my broker or market maker or somebody like knew where my positions were. And that became a thing of the past with the methodology. How? Because the market can't be manipulated beyond the ability of what the market can bear. And so if you can see where the demand factors are, you can also see the elasticity of how far price can stretch out before it needs to respond to the overwhelming majority of where the demand is, and it's got to snap back. So with that being said, that means you can see where you have to take, or you know, what price levels has, have to be taken into account so you're not spiked out or surprised by some market movement you didn't see coming. You're not going to get blindsided by those anymore because you can see those take them into account and you no longer have to be a victim of those things. And so that's the other thing that I think people have to be aware of is, is you don't have to be worried about a manipulated or rigged market because now you can see just how far a market can be manipulated and you take that into account. And if there's enough return for the reward, at least a one-to-one -one or better, you could take that. If not, okay, then I'm going to pass on that. Does that right. make sense? Right. And I love how much you're focusing on people throughout this, this whole discussion, right? It's a natural byproduct of investing that we're all aiming for profits, but you're talking about building skill sets, empowering people, teaching others to do what you do, eliminating nervous, reactionary training activity, and obviously it's going to bleed into other parts of life too. But I think that really resonates with us at Viking, especially because founding principles are people, planet, profit. So despite us being a real estate investment firm, obviously we are focused on the finances and, and providing you know, a great return for our investors. But at the end of the day, it's the people. We want to educate our investors. We want to prove the lives of our tenants, of our brokers, of our lenders. So it's just really great and refreshing to hear you know, someone to plug in. Same thing with the, the Sunday story where you're plugging into people over yeah. the profits. You're focused on the time freedom over winning or losing in the stock market or in real estate. I, I'll, I want to say something about that because uh, it's interesting that you, you, that you mentioned that. So I have, because this wasn't something that I had intended on doing, kind of fell in my lap and it was just such a joy. Having been burned the vast majority of my life, even by well-meaning people, by the way, people who really thought they were doing good, but they were victims themselves of their own limitations to focus on price and not realizing where demand is. And so they're constantly looking at, okay, here's, here's the upgrade. Here's the upsell. Here's the version 2.0. Here's constantly selling me the next new thing. It was frustrating, right? So I, I wanted to just make sure that people felt I wanted to be the exact opposite of what people experienced in the market. So I, I thought long and hard. It took me a few years to figure this out. And, and actually it took me a few years to even figure out kind of like how to even run this in a way that made sense. I don't, I don't feel exploited, but I also made sure not to ex uh, want anyone to feel exploited. So what I did was I, I decided, well, let me look at the, what would someone pay to basically invest in something that they know they had a guaranteed success, like a franchise or, or, a, or a career, right? You go to medical school, you know, you've got a guaranteed successful career. You buy a franchise like Subway or McDonald's, you know, you have a pretty much a guaranteed success. You know, when you think about what's the, cost of access and opportunity like that. And I thought, well, all right, then to me, then there are people who will pay that, but then they'll go on and make millions, which eclipses what they had to pay initially to, to be able to gain the skill or career. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that, so that I'm happy with that. So I just don't want to feel exploited or feel foolish for just giving myself away. So I decided, let me create a kind of a, a scenario where my tuition is one thing that would make me feel good. But out of that, I thought, well, the first 12 months are the most critical in someone's experience because they have to go through the training and from the training, they have to learn to apply the process of analysis and do it in a safe harbor before they get on a real money account so they can prove to themselves that they can do it, that they can replicate that success that I absolutely deliver on my promise. And so when they finish that cycle, then they're ready to go, they're ready to, go to a real money account. Well, when they go on a real money account, I don't care whether they have a half a million, 5 million, or they want to start with a hundred thousand or 50,000. It doesn't matter. I always make a person start with just a few thousand dollars just to just test the waters and make sure they're not going to behave differently with this. And I'm going to tell you why, because like a car is designed for a specific set of performance, how you drive it is up to you, right? 
So my methodology is very much like that. It's designed for a very specific set of performance, but how you drive it, you can drive it off the road. You can be abusive. You can be aggressive. So I want to see how people are, because what happens is when they realize they have the control that they have in the safe harbor on a, on a fake money account and kind of trying it out where everything's real except for the money, and they realize, wow, this thing really delivers, they can get a bit cocky sometimes. And they start to kind of get aggressive with the real money. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. we want to catch that, mate. Drive it the way it's meant to be drive so you can have a long, successful, enjoyable experience, right? And so I monitor that. And there's a reason why I make this strictly a mentoring program because I can't deliver this in a home study course and think I'm actually delivering something with any intellectual honesty. I, I know people will fundamentally drift. I can make a lot more money, work a lot less, but, but that's not where my heart's at and that's not where I'm at in life. And I think it's, it's really a disservice. So I do not allow people to just take this as a home study course because I know it's going to set them up for interpreting their own way. They're going to do it their own right. way and they're going to, right? So you, you have to monitor accountability is critical. And again, think of any sports athlete or high-performing CEO, they all have coaches and mentors. They all need someone outside of them to help guide them, nudge them, direct them on the right path and to stay on path, right? So we, it's like a gym partner, right? It's more easy to kind of be lazy and skip the gym. But if you got a gym partner, you're more likely to stay with your discipline. So there's a wisdom to that. So the accountability and the feedback from someone like myself versus somebody reading off a script is critical. So I make it very high touch and very, I don't take on more people than I think I can, that I know that I can take care of, right? And I, I've been averaging maybe 10 or 12, 10 to 20 people a year over the last 12 years. And by the way, if anyone looks me up, I know a lot of this kind of sounds like it's too good to be true. Does this really sound like this exists? Well, sure. Yeah, look, 12 years with the internet, social media, bad news travels 10 times faster than good news, right? So they can easily look up and see if they can dig up dirt and see, wow, there's never been a single person that's complained that I've not delivered on my promise, right? Mm -hmm. And that should, and people should take time to read the kind of client experiences so they can see from a client's perspective, what were they experiencing? It's not this hypey, claimy stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's people, real people that you can verify. And so the idea is what I do is I like to take people in stages. And then when I see, I review, I see, oh, you've been a diligent applicant on the process. Now I'll let you add more of your capital you've got set aside. And let's review again, take a few more positions, review again. And we step them up until they've come to the point where they've put in all the capital they want, but it methodically, right? So it's, it's very structured to help them grow both in experience or earning while they're learning in the first 12 months. And they're building that confidence along the way, right? I don't just, just throw them in, oh, good luck. No. Yeah. It so, goes back to that system that you were talking about where it's a barometer that you can use regardless of the situation that you're in, because you're teaching the person to become empowered to yeah. recognize those demand imbalances, and they can apply it to any system. I'm a big movie buff, and I was watching um, Top Gun Maverick over the weekend. Yeah. A quote really stuck out to me. It's not the plane, it's the pilot. Yeah. So it's the person who's driving and who has that discipline, who has that self-confidence, regardless of what plane, what investment vehicle they're, they're stepping into. If you can teach somebody to be educated, same thing that we're doing with investors. We want them to be educated and well-informed, regardless of whether they invest with us or they invest with somebody else. And in fact, it's probably better for you to diversify and invest with a whole lot of groups, but our goal at the end of the day is to empower those to make their, their own decision, whether it be physicians or any other type of investor as well. So yeah, I think one of the things that I, I want to comment on is because I, it's important for a person coming into this, not to just feel empowered, but to also know that they're being cared for and supported in a way that's tangible. Actions speak louder than words in my book. That's been my philosophy. And so what I do is I've structured my tuition where what does it cost me in the first 12 months to take someone from zero to thriving, right? Growing their accounts, destiny, the first 12 months. And my targets for them, because of demand and balance arbitrage, it has the ability to allow the, enable a person to get back their initial capital that's invested within the first year. That's really huge. So I look at, well, what is it costing me to serve and support them? And so I just want them to carry their own weight, right? Essentially. So I'll take a percentage of that much old tuition and say, you just pay me a down payment that covers that, my cost that I'm going to incur, carry your own weight. And then after you've doubled your money on that initial investment, help you become profitable, then you can pay me on performance. Yep. And then I'm happy to profit because then I think my profit should come when you're profiting. If you're not profiting, then either I've done a bad job in the evaluation. I took on somebody who shouldn't have been part of my program. That means I've got to spend more time with them because they have habits that maybe 
I should have known about and kind of say, you know what, that personality style is not good for this. You shouldn't do it. And if I right. miss that and they come in, guess what? I have to take down the chin and give them the extra time to help them overcome a bad habit. And that's a, a cost and a, you know, expense for me, but now I'm committed. I've got to do the right thing. And that's the kind of environment we foster. And that's why you'll, you look at us, you'll see that people are just like sing our praises. They love us because they know yeah. we love them. We take care of them. So I think that's an important point for, for your audience. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because the structure is pretty similar to how us as operators work as well, where we promise our investors, you know, a specific return, but we don't take part in the profit sharing until they've gotten their investment and then their return of capital. And yeah. then we take part in the profit sharing. So it's great to hear that you indoctrinate somebody in the program, help them along the way, and then only then are you taking part in the profits. Yeah, I because return of capital is more is just as important as return on capital. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Can you explain, I know you've mentioned this in past conversations, what the four C's are and how that ties in everything that we're talking about? So because of the objectivity and the the clarity that you get, which really is the first C, clarity, what happens is now you have a level of control, the second C. Mm -hmm. So first C is clarity. Second C is control. Well, and because of the clarity and the control, due to the accuracy, because of the real-time demand factors, right, that's going to produce consistency. That's the third C. So clarity, control, consistency, and guess what those three produce? They give birth to confidence, the fourth C. Right. So if you're not confident about what you're doing, you're going to screw it up. Okay. So confidence is important, but you can't have confidence unless you have a level of clarity that comes from total objectivity. You can't have something subjective where 10 people look at something and they have different, 10 different opinions about it. It has to be, you know, again, if you go to an RV, you know, we're in an RV and all 10 people in the RV look at the gas tank, it shows a core tank of gas, they can all agree that that's not going to get them 250 miles down the road, right? That's an objective piece of information. But if they're going to sit and argue about, I don't know, I think we can make it just to start driving, we've got a problem. So that is what takes us from clarity to having control. So you know you're not going to run out of gas. You know you're going to actually uh, arrive to your destination. You don't have a check engine light on. You know you all the things are kind of checking the boxes, right? That's the control, the clarity. And then when you're doing that, that's a, isn't that a reliable process that you reliably repeat, you can replicate at will? That creates the consistency because you have reliable, accurate information. How do I know it's accurate? Because I'm looking at demand factors that matter what lead price. So there we go. Now I've got an experience and my experience when replicated over and over again keeps telling me, wow. Um, I've learned how to forecast because this is not, you know, come to learn how to trade. This is come to learn a skill of how to forecast accurately and objectively. Well, I can't fake or cheat that because I either know what's going to happen to the market next or I don't. So when the market's here, I have to be able to say, I know with the market, it's going to do this and it's not, it shouldn't do this before doing this. And I get to see when it unfolds, was I right or wrong? So there's no way to mess with that, right? You can't fake that. And so that performance, as you see that, that's what breeds the confidence. And that's really the four C's, clarity, control, consistency, and confidence. I think it comes back to simplicity as well, right? The oh, reason yeah. you get so frazzled and overwhelmed is because you know there's all these different factors in the market and you don't know what to pay attention to. But going back to eight demand factors, if you were to portray all eight demand factors on the graph of the visual representation simultaneously, that's going to cause more harm than good, where people are going to be confused and they don't understand it. But by simplifying and say, hey, all these eight demand factors, they come together and, and the sum is larger than the whole is, is larger than the sum of the, the individual parts, and it's all condensed into one visual representation. That is what also instills confidence where you can say, hey, I understand all these moving parts, but there's only a few set factors that I really need to pay attention to that are really going to move the needle forward. That's true. And it's very similar to your dashboard in your car or an airplane or anything. There's a lot of complicated calculations going on behind the dashboard, right? Underneath the hood. And so all you need to know is, look, just how much gas do I have here left? Is my car overheating? That's all I want to know. So yeah, I've, yeah, I, you, gosh, Nathan, I had dozens of things that you had four monitors. Now, would you believe what I told you? <laughs> Where's my, 
I have a laptop computer. I, it was during him, I must have moved it. It's like, it, it's a 13 inch monitor laptop. Okay. I doubled my account while I was traveling and visiting my family in Lebanon and Dubai between my cousin's house, my aunt's house, and Dunkin' Donuts out there, okay, on their Wi Fi, which is crazy today. I think I'm like, I actually I was trading on Wi Fi and Dunkin' Donuts. That's, that was stupid. I don't know what I was thinking. It's full <laughs> of vinegar. But so you, it doesn't take all this, all this stuff, right? It is, I keep, so what happened was I had to simplify it. So when I finally was able to correlate all the different demand factors into one visual indication at the bottom that showed me what the combined aggregate impact on demand is going to be. So you could see them. So like with Tesla, as an example, when it was at a, at 700, you saw demand one place, right? And it went up to a thousand and kind of, and you saw that demand was moving up and then it went down and then demand went up. And for some reason, obviously me, price went back up to a thousand and demand for some reason fell. C, well, where did demand fall? Well, when it was at a thousand, demand fell right back to where it was when it was at, when price was at 700. So it's very visually intuitive. It's nothing complicated, right? It's very simple. And so you're right. I think if it's not simple, that's going to complicate life and it's going to make it hard. And that's why I say people who are intimidated by, well, I don't think I'm smart enough. No, it doesn't take smarts. I've got homemakers that women who basically were high school sweethearts, now in their 60s, they didn't really go to, to college and get an academic degree. They didn't go work. They were they, they homeschooled. And now they're looking at their retirement. They want to, they want more security and control and kind of, and so they're learning this for the first time and, and they're running circles around guys who are, you know, engineers, you know, because why they were able to follow instructions. So I think one of my things that I always look for when I ask questions to people, when I'm in, in an evaluation session, I'm trying to see if that person not only has a, has the ability to follow instructions, but has the humility to submit to a process and do things the way it's been proven, not come thinking that they're going to put their own idea and their own spin on this. Does that make sense? Yep. And giving back to others that are giving to others. Same thing that we're doing to physicians where they spend their entire life caring for others. And we finally get the opportunity and, and the honor of giving back to them as well. So Correct. Yeah. I want to end this with a quote that I was reading from the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. And this is the quote. Master the art of timing. Never seem to be in a hurry. For hurrying betrays a lack of control over yourself and over time. Always seem patient as if you know that everything will come to you eventually. Become a detective of the right moment and sniff out the spirit of the times, the trends that will carry you to power. Learn to stand back when the time is not yet ripe and to strike fiercely when it has reached its fruition. I love that quote. Nathan, a couple of weeks ago, that's so interesting that you bring that up because a couple of weeks ago, I come across that quote and I was like, I said, you know what? That's a quote that I want. I have to share with a friend of mine, and it was so timely. And so it's just that's uh, it's just funny that you're bringing that up because I was just on my radar just a couple of weeks ago. So yes, sir. I so love sir, that quote. It it's so true. Yeah, uh, it's pretty amazing. Roger, how can our listeners get a hold of you if they want to learn more about you? So uh, basically, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not a marketer guy. So, so what I do is, as I kind of just do things the way I wish would be would, would be shared with me. So what I did is I put together a mini course primer on demand imbalance arbitrage that teaches you what demand imbalance arbitrage is, how it works. There's examples, there's evidence, there's proof. There's It answers all the questions that people have asked me all the years. So by the time that they get through that, they can see if that's something they want to do. I uh, have a list of requirements to work with me. If they feel like they meet that, they can fill out a short application and then submit to book and a, an appointment to have an evaluation with me. And then it's an honest God evaluation. Don't be thinking that you're going to get sold because you're going to have to sell me on why I should take you because I only have so many people I can take that I could be personally involved with in, in a year. And so I'm looking for certain personal attributes, circumstances, and things that, that are not going to work against the person, put them under pressure. Because I, I don't want people pressured to do anything. If they're pressured, think of like, you know how to drive a car. Well, when you're under pressure, to get to an appointment because you're running late to it, you drive that car differently. Even though you know the rules of the road, you know how to drive, but now you start to increase your risk for getting into an accident, getting a speeding ticket or, or, or a life altering event. So I'm all about no pressure. So what I've done is I've set up a situation where you, 
by the time you come to me, you should have been able to make a decision on your own. Hey, this is what I want to do. And now I just want to make sure that this guy is willing to accept me, that we have a meeting of the minds and that this thing makes good financial business sense for me and that we can move forward from there if it makes sense. So the mini course primer on demand and balance arbitrage is located at investingfortoday.com, investingfortoday.com. And it's (laughs) F-O-R, the word for Uh, So investingfortoday.com and they'll get access to the mini course primer. And uh, again, uh, there's, there's no sales pitch. There's no, just an educational pathway. And if they like it and they want to move forward, they can uh, set up a time to evaluate uh, whether this is something that is a good fit for both of us. And we can talk about the options or what uh, makes sense for them based on their unique needs, because everyone has their own personal needs of how much time they might need. Their learning ability, their time frames, their 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 personality. There's all kinds of things that to be considered, and so we want to make sure it's a good fit. I would you believe me if I tell you that I average between sixty to ninety percent rate where I say this is not a good fit. So I can't just take on everybody because they want it. It has to make sense. But I'm not I'm obviously warm and caring and respectful. I tell people why it's not a good fit to make sure that to redirect them on things that's going to be ideal for them. Just because you've got money, just because you want to do something, anyone can do this, but it's not for everybody because it, I have found over the years that it takes a certain temperament and a situation that allows them to be able to experience what this thing promises. It's just like you wouldn't put a 16-year-old in a brand new $2 million Lamborghini and they just got their driver's license, mm-hmm. right? Believe it or not, I've, got, I've had that experience. That's how I learned this. Early on when I thought I could just teach anyone who wants to be taught, I had a gentleman he was running a $2 billion company. He was the VP of it. Okay. And uh, he came to me and he proved the success. He, and he, you know, he actually got to a place where he was earning his monthly income on average per week with his part time effort. So it was over a couple of year period. And so, but that, but he was always aggressive. And I kept telling him, you got to not be aggressive. You got to be. And so one day he says, you know what? I want to leave. I don't, I no longer want to work. I want to just do this full time. And I said, you know what? That is the wrong thing to do. If you do that while you're still aggressive, you're going to engage the market in a way that's not really going to serve you. And he did it his way. And guess what happened? His aggression and the cockiness of being overconfident, think I can do whatever. I've proven this to myself. I've arrived. It's the wrong mentality, wrong attitude. He had pressures to perform to his wife, who was an entrepreneur, and he wanted her to not have to work. That wasn't her. She didn't say I wanted that. He wanted that. And so guess what? He all of a sudden ran that thing off the road, right? And he just blew himself up because, and so I was so, just such a heartache. And I don't want to see that. And I don't want to do that. I want to be the reason for someone doing that. So I start to, I learned how to ask questions to see if, if that kind of personality is what's coming to me. If it is, I'm going to say, you know what? This is not a good place for, you should focus and stay focused on real estate or something else, right? So there is a very mindful approach to this. I don't want people thinking I'm a, they're going to come and get sold. That's not, it's going to be the, Quite the opposite. So I, I think if people find it refreshing too, I really respect the individual and, and their situation. So no, I love that yeah, you're that's on serving people and not doing it a service and really find the right fit. So yeah, absolute pleasure, Roger. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed Absolutely. you guys. Talk soon. All right. Take care. Right. Bye-bye.